anger as an emotion is morally neutral. And we know, of course, that Jesus himself, being completely human, had that emotion and he demonstrated it on a number of occasions. With the money changers in the temple, when Peter uh, said, skip Jerusalem, it's too dangerous, he said, get behind me, you Satan. And in today's passage, when his opponent said, well, we know your mother and father, you're nothing special. And he said, well, you think you know Mary, my mother. You think you know Joseph, my father. But you really don't know how great they were and are. You're misjudging them radically. And then you don't understand, more importantly, my heavenly father. But you can feel there was tension and emotion coming there through the Christ as his parents and stepfather were being attacked as well as himself. So we can have anger without it being sinful. And in fact, later in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul says something very practical. If you're angry, let it be without sin. In other words, don't be angry at the wrong person at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. And don't have your anger be so overwhelming that it's totally out of proportion to the offense you've received. But then he finally says, and don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't carry the anger from one day to the next, letting it build and build and build till finally we become a walking minefield. Nevertheless, Paul in today's passage really takes anger to task. And I would bet that 99% of the things that have hurt us the most has come from anger and rage. When people we love and respect have done things to us and said things to us that have left scars for a lifetime. And probably many of the things we regret the most we did in an angry rage. Anger is a powerful emotion that could lead to really deadly sins. One of our senior priests in the Society of St. Paul many years ago, when he was stationed in western New York, received a call late at night from a woman who was frantic. Her husband and their adult son were in a bitter argument she said, Father, could you come right away? So he goes to their home, and by the time he arrives there, it had escalated to the point where father and son had drawn weapons on one another, guns. He comes into the situation. He said, all right, let's put the guns away. And they wouldn't because the anger and rage and bitterness and hatred had reached such a point that they didn't trust one another to put down the gun first. But both of them, thank God, trusted the priest. So he went over, he took one gun in one hand, another gun in the other hand. He said, all right, when I count to three, I think we're both going to let go and give me these weapons. And they did that. And then he sat down with them, and he heard their anger, their bitterness. He calmed them. He gave them alternate ways of resolving their conflicts. He prayed with them. Then in the wee hours of the morning, he left, getting back to our community. There was no news the next day, double murder in the suburbs. There weren't camera people outside the house saying, how could this terrible tragedy have happened? But only because a priest came with the peace of Christ into a violent, conflict-filled situation. How much domestic strife and sorrow and heartbreak arises out of anger unchecked and rage. How much unhappiness in marriage between married couples comes out of years of angry outbursts back and forth. How much fear and uncertainty and sadness 
is in the lives of every family and especially the children when they see rage ruling in a home. When I was ordained in this very chapel back in 1974 by Bishop Malone, it was a great day for my family, friends, my congregation. Then I had my first mass in my local parish, Immaculate Heart of Mary. And then I went on vacation and I was invited out west by friends to spend a week with them. And I had my second mass in a large suburban parish. They had a great choir, great congregation. And I was happy to be there to celebrate mass. I go back to my friend's home to spend the afternoon uh, planning out some touristy things to see. The doorbell rings and says, is this where that visiting priest is staying? My friend said, oh yes. And so I go to the door and a woman says, Father, could you come over to our home for a few minutes? We're having a problem. So I said, okay, and I go with her. I get in the car, her husband's driving. As Soon as I get in the car, she burst into tears. I go to the home and there's a 13-year-old boy hiding in the basement. There's a 15-year-old girl packing to get out of there. And I listen to their conflict, their anger, their rage, their fighting back and forth. And after three hours of listening and giving them alternate ways to work out their family conflicts, saying a prayer for them, giving them a blessing, I returned to my friend's home and I said, well, I guess you're never on vacation from being a priest. <laughs> so the, we could see the results of rage and anger in families. And patterns of rage and anger that could dominate decades and a lifetime lead to so many other problems. How many acts of betrayal, of abandonment, of adultery have arisen because of the life sapping, energy draining, ongoing warfare in marriages. And so St. Paul said, listen, cut it out. Stop your yelling, your screaming, your reviling one another. That means calling each other vile names. Stop it. Stop it. Rather live the way Jesus taught us in peace and tranquility, showing one another mutual respect. But how do we do that? Because anger is like a drug. It gets a deeper and deeper hold on us as the years go by. The great Cardinal uh, Newman of uh, Britain in the 19th century said, well, if you're angry, count to 10 before you do or say anything. And if you're really angry, count to 100. <laughs> The problem is, usually rage courses through our veins before our brain gets in gear. And words start coming out of our mouth before we even have a chance to think about them. So what can we do to learn how to control this intoxicating, dangerous drug? Because after an angry outburst, two things happen. For a while, we feel like we've evened the score. We've said what had to be said. We feel a momentary relief. But within hours, our stomach is in knots. We feel discomforted. We don't know what to do. We can't leave the house. We can't go back to the house. We can't do this. How are we going to get along with our life? So it has a great deal of other pain and sorrow. How do we handle that rage, that anger? Well, there's two ways of getting people's attention. One is by shouting. And St. Paul said, stop your shouting and your yelling. That's the way we normally handle anger. Our voices become uglier and uglier and louder and louder. And we say things that are meaner and meaner. And we get into that terrible situation of hurting people we love the most and being hurt by them. There's another way to get a person's attention, by whispering, whispering. We feel that rage going through us, and rather than shouting, we say, I'm really upset right now. Could you give me a moment to collect myself? You know that 
we always yell and scream at each other when this topic comes up. I don't want to do that just this one time. So by softening our voice, we might be trembling inside, upset terribly, we begin to slow down our metabolism. And we have to say to ourselves, maybe if I could just not lose it for five more minutes, I'll save myself a day or two days or three days of conflict and anger and guilt and bitterness, etc. And then we have to think, the words that are about to come out of my mouth might echo in that other person's soul and mind for the rest of their lives. Do I want to be remembered as a walking minefield, somebody that has, everybody has to tiptoe around, or someone that people are delighted to be around because they're not going to be victims of violent explosions? Now, we could rewrite the pattern of our lives. We may have always been a hothead, hot-tempered. There's no reason why, starting today, we can't be a lot calmer, a lot more tranquil, a lot more gentle with others and ourselves. But it'll take practice. It takes discipline. And yes, it takes self-sacrifice. Sometimes we're going to have to be in a position where we don't try to even the score. Because once we get in that position, it's never even. So anger and rage, St. Paul says, stop it, stop it. And if we could stop that, then we could lower the amount of domestic violence, community violence, and maybe even learn to have a little more peaceful world as a whole. But we won't be able to do it on our own. It's almost like needing a 12-step program. And the first thing an alcoholic or a drug addict has to say is, I need God to overcome this addiction. And then there has to also be the sense of reinforcing our calmness by trying to learn from calm people. Maybe have a friend or relative who never loses their cool. He says, what can I learn from that person? How can I be more like that person? And to lower the amount of anger in our immediate environments is helpful. And then in a 12-step program, alcoholics and drug addicts have to try to make up for the damage they've caused. We've said, I've said a lot of vile things about this person or to that person. Maybe I could say some nice things about them and to them to try to heal the damage that I've done. And I've been the victim of anger and abuse in so many ways. Can I learn to forgive that person so I won't be angry and abusive to others? In other words, as St. Paul said, for all of us to be more like the Christ who knows us, who forgives us, and who loves us.